Hi there, I'm Andrew McComb and welcome to Outlier. In this week's episode, I'm in Jakarta, Indonesia, where I'm going to be speaking to Laurie Montague. He's one of the world's best performance coaches. Well guys, Laurie has so much to share when it comes to human potential and performance, so let's go and meet him. Laurie Montague, welcome to Outlier. Thanks Andrew, thanks for having me mate. Mate, we're in the middle of Jakarta in the Bogor Highlands here, mm. beautiful place, yeah. but not normal, and you're one of the world's best golf coaches. How did you end up here? Uh, it, well, long story short, that's a, that's a long story. <laughs> Where it starts, this, this part of the journey is, we're five years into this. My business partner and I, David Milne, uh, some 10 years ago, had a conversation one night where we talked about if we could do golf coaching from a coaching experience again all over, what would we do differently? And so we talked at length about what he'd learned over the years. If he was going to do it again, what would he do differently? And I did the same thing. And we came to this conclusion that we could you know, have a clean slate, start again with a new kind of academy that focused more on developing holistically, developing a lot more skills. Because we, we found that the one common denominator in, in the golf instruction industry is it is very focused towards swing technique, which you can understand with average players. You know, they, they're not hitting the ball well, they want to play better. So, of course, it's going to be directed more towards getting people to hit the ball better. But elite players, what we found, and we both had extensive experience working with elite golfers, uh, that is golfers that are representing the state or province or territory, or even representing at national level, and, and of course professional players as well, we found that the focus was still so much on that, that the indoctrination of this way of thinking, this swing focus from a very young age, it's very hard for them to escape it. So when they're not playing well, they continually go back to I'm broken in some way and I need to fix my golf swing and we said well what if we had a different approach what if we looked at all the skills that weren't, be, weren't being focused on that actually have a huge impact on the way someone performs and so over a course of six months of preparation building websites and all the things that you need to do I then made the move from the Gold Coast in Queensland Australia to Perth where Dave had been based for a long time. Originally he was from Singapore and he moved there in the early 80s. And I've known David since the years I played on the Pro Tour. So, you know, when I'd play in Perth, play the tournaments over there, David would be playing locally. Dave's a bit older than me, but he'd be playing, he was a club pro there. And so we got to know one another and over the years, I'd be back there and catch up a bit and uh, got closer and closer. Then we do some international trips together. And uh, yeah, so, so we worked well together. But we're very different personality, and but we figured that would work as well. So uh, I moved across there. We set up this this what's called Pro Tour Golf College at Joondalup Golf Resort there, and uh, where David was based. And we started building the program and testing what our theories were like uh, with the students based on the idea that what we would ultimately do was we would not be there we would be in asia somewhere mm -hmm. that we saw the future as being asia that we saw 10 years ago we saw that the center of the universe was going to be asia for golf you know koreans were already great japanese are already great players indians were uh, the indian tour and, and they were growing ties and we thought that we've got to be more there so over four years in australia in perth we developed the systems fine-tuned them and then we presented a proposal to the Indonesian Golf Association to the chairman and his board and they liked what they heard now we didn't get an initial response but they liked what they heard and then to cut a long story short uh, we got to to do that and we we've done that for five years and uh, we're moving to a second five-year phase now Dave um, is, is decided to focus a little more on going back to Perth and he's coaching a really good club there because he wants to be with his family he's got you know he's got grandkids and a whole lot of things 
I just have my wife Susie and myself, so uh, I'm going to stay on and, and go into this next phase of, of the program, which is to expand. We've been pretty much Jakarta centric, and now mm. we're going to expand it throughout Indonesia. That's the plan. Big challenges, of course. Um, but which, you are you are coaching the Indonesian golf team. We, yeah, we're both coaching the team, preparing them over the time, and I'll continue to do that mm. until such times as they want to change mm. that situation. And so, obviously, it didn't start here. It started earlier than that. You didn't just become a, a world class golf coach. No. How does it? How does it? Begin? Well, yeah, I've nearly been thirty years doing this uh, elite level coaching, literally coaching very good players. I got my first. I mean, I started as national coach in Australia in nineteen ninety two. So, what are we? What's that? Twenty-nine years ago. So I've been coaching at elite level for that long, and mm. one of the really great breaks for me early in the piece was, firstly, I was I was coaching at camps and things and getting known to people, and supporting the local, you know, junior camps and things. We'd have summer camps in Sydney uh, around Christmas time. So I was doing those and got to know Ross Herbert, who was at the time working at the Rothmans Foundation running all the programs for the New South Wales Golf Association. And through my support of that program and Ross getting to know me, uh, Ross was moving on from Rothmans Foundation to being the first AIS golf coach. Mm -hmm. um, Australian Institute of Sport. Right, Australian Institute of Sport. So he moved into that role and, and I applied for the Rothmans job and, and because uh, you know I'd been really supporting the program, I think up to that point of time, probably 10 years in a row just doing the camps and doing whatever else I could do. Um, I got the position with the Rothmans Foundation, which was a national position where at the time, I mean, Rothmans company was well into sport. You would know they were into motor racing, mm. all sorts of things. So I was, I was uh, running the golf division and we had other sports there, athletics, you name it, all, and they were all in one place in Kent Street in Sydney. And the cool thing for me was as a, as a fledgling coach, if you like, working with elite players, I knew practically nothing. I was a good player when I played professionally, but I didn't really know how to get people to be better at what they did. But fortunately, I was in this very fortunate position where I was in an office with uh, senior coaches, sort of my age now or older, who'd been coaching in their craft for 30 years. And, and they started to introduce me to a whole range of things that I just had never, you know, been exposed to before, mm. predominantly around sports science. And I realized in those early days that this was very different for golf because I was attending conferences and it was still mostly about swing. You know, this guy's theory versus the next guy's theory and mm. studying swings on and so on. I thought, you know, I'm working with these elite players now and they swing the club pretty good, Andrew. You know, like they're hitting the ball good. I can't really do a lot with that. Mm. How do I make them better? And so that was the key question. And so the coaches at our, at our weekly coach meetings, we'd sit around and they'd say, how can we help you? And some of them knew a bit about golf. And, and I said, you know, I really don't know the first thing about how to improve someone. And so one of the guys said, Which well, is fascinating because you're now in a coaching role, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, this is, you know, 30 years yeah. ago, right? And uh, so they introduced me to some books that were extremely helpful at the beginning. Uh, the Theory and Methodology of Training by Tudor Bomper, which, you know, when you went through your sports science degree would have been a, one of your texts for sure. Uh, so I learned about periodization. I needed to know, understand that. I needed to understand how to take a, a calendar year and look at the schedule of tournaments and then learn how to break it down and then learn from that place how to insert all the factors that are involved in performance improvement. Well, I still have that book and I still read it almost every day along with a whole lot of others, Isherin and a whole lot of other guys that have, mm. you know. But you know what? It was those initial, it was at that initial time I was so fortunate that those guys took me under their wing and they genuinely wanted to help me to be mm. a better coach. Mm. And so I moved from being this golf teacher role of standing on a tee one-on-one, -on -one, even though I was doing a lot of that at the time, to this idea of this holistic approach and go, well, there's uh, so many more factors involved in developing the human. And that's kind of, you know, from that position, from that place, um, the, with the Rothmans Foundation, I then, you know, became one of the youngest national coaches in Australia. So you coached the yeah. Australian women's team? Women's team, yeah, for, from 92, nearly 93 to 98. Mm -hmm. So I travelled to a bunch of world championships with them, worked with them. I worked with them when Kari Webb was still a junior player in the side and stuff. So I saw firsthand 
young players that went on, in her case, legend status, you know, became one of the f most famous golfers of all time. Uh, so, women's golfers of all time, but I worked with a lot of guys to at national, like at AIS camps and so on. And so I was really getting thrown into the deep end, working with elite talent, elite golf talent. Just just before you go on with that, yeah. you were also a professional player, right? So obviously you, you had a path going in one direction at one point. What, why did you change to coaching? You know, uh, it's a great question. Like so many people, I just wasn't good enough. And, and, and it bugged the hell out of me. And, and, uh, but in a strange sort of a way, I wasn't good enough. I had a, a modicum of success. I got better. But I didn't know why I was getting better. I was practicing a lot like everyone else. And I was looking, when I'm practicing on the range and I'm next to successful players, I couldn't see really a lot of difference. And, you know, if I was playing in big events, I might be next to a world-class player. And I'm watching them hit the ball and I'm going, well, I hit it good, but, you know, I walk in off the golf course and their scores are lower. Mm. And, you know, as a professional, one of the first things you learn is you learn that, you know, when you look at the leaderboard at a tournament, when you arrive at a tournament, you know, it could be round one, but you've got a one o'clock tee off. So you get it, you know, you might arrive at 10. Mm. There's already, already, there's probably already a 64 on the board or a mm. 65. And you go, okay, welcome to this world. It's a scoring world, right? So, so a lot of golf performance is, bottom line is about score. But here's the interesting thing about that. As I moved into the coaching role, I kept getting feedback from different sources in and around golf saying, stop focusing on score, stop focusing on, focusing on score. I'm going, and I was a bit confused. I'm going, well, how does one get better if you don't focus on the score? What I learned from the coaches that, at the Rothmans Foundation was it scores everything, that they're measuring um, times for swimming or running around a track or whatever it happens to be. There's a whole lot of measurement. And as you get deeper into the sports science end, you realize there are a whole lot of measures mm. that you have to look at, markers, performance markers, if you will. And uh, so I kept bumping into this stuff and I'm going, what's that all about you know and it was it was this thing about at early days that some of the sports psychologists early guys had suggested you know having a an outcome focus was not very so helpful external, yeah which is fair enough but the people who were saying this didn't understand what they were really saying yeah. because at the end of the day you can't get someone better at the game if you don't have a score focus mm. and to this day the interesting thing about dave and my program is that it was completely score focused so we were a golf scoring school not a golf swing school of so which there are many you're using score as a benchmark not an external like today i'm going to shoot 64 you're using it as a benchmark to aspire to in your training process is that right yeah actually we, we want the players to to believe in their heart of hearts that they can shoot 64 mm. but that to do that they're going to go through a process that leads to that 64 mm. or whatever mm. score it leads mm. to but they have to build the confidence to stand on the first team, mm. knowing that it's very possible that that could happen. That even if they got themselves into a position where, let's say, they're five, six, seven under for the day, that they actually embrace the, the, that place, that mm. really awesome place they're playing, that, where they and just be. go deeper. Yeah, yeah. And so I had the experience through that process of working with a young Korean golfer. I worked with a few Korean golfers that ended up successful on the ladies. Pro Tour and uh, I started them with as juniors mm. and I worked through this process that I'd been influenced by by the coaches uh, from the Rothmans Foundation and, and uh, early days I was a girl by the name of Gloria Park I coached her from uh, when I was in New South Wales uh, to she got to the LPGA Tour and won on the tour and then mm. later on uh, a girl who's now one of the top players in the world uh, Amy Yang and she was one of the early breakthroughs for me in understanding that this, this type of process could net great results. Um, because Amy won the Australian Ladies Masters. She got an invite as an amateur, as a 16-year-old, and went wow. out and won, beat all the pros. And the, when the press started to interview me about, because Amy didn't speak much English, so I, I had to kind of take care of a lot of the press they would say, how do you get a 16-year-old to win a tournament? Well, it wasn't long after that, Lydia Ko started to do the same thing in New mm. Zealand. And, uh, and now it's a more regular thing to see. But the point was that there was this process in place that was leading to low score development. And that's what I felt was a different path that I was on, moving away from that technical mm. swing development path. And, mm. and so there's all these, as I said, there's all these different performance markers that are involved that you look at 
to help drive scores low, mm. which to this day makes us quite unique mm. still. So you're, where'd you come from originally? Like back in the day? Uh, back in the day, um, really early in the day, I grew up on the central coast of New South Wales, went to school there, just into high school and then moved to Foster on the mid-north coast, finished my high school there and then moved to Sydney and trained as a golf professional yep. uh, at the Australian Golf Club in Sydney. So that's important to me. The reason I ask that question for all the outliers that are out there and the young entrepreneurs, etc. cetera. Yep. Central Coast of Australia, for those that don't know, isn't very populated. It's a long way out of anywhere. Yep. Not so much nowadays, because the city's sort Back of Back in those days it was when I was living there, yeah. But I guess what I'm asking the question is you've gone from there to here, he's yeah. one of the best coaches in the world, running a whole organisation, general manager of the of the um, Indonesian golf team. I guess is, it, is that how you'd put it? Uh, you're basically the foundation that this this that supports all of this. Yeah, yeah. And that's the new role. So I just want to, in your journey, highlight. You don't have to start from anywhere, do you? It can be any, or it, you can start from anywhere. Well, I, th- I think if you if you looked at it and said, you know, and, and my you know my parents' dad's uh, was a bricklayer, um, mum was pretty much stay at home mum sometimes you know money was tight so she'd go out and work at times uh, doing all sorts of things so there was uh, always more month at the end of the money right Mm. and in the family so I um, just got you know I had this motivation to get good at this I mean I used to surf I used to love surfing but I had to make a decision I was playing a lot of rugby I was surfing and then I was playing golf and it got to a stage where I had to make a decision and it turned out to be golf and it was, I'll tell you, it's it an interesting story. Uh, I was at 17 years old, and I was at the summer camp that I ended up teaching at. But I was there, the club that I was playing at the time, Foster Golf Club, uh, which is mid-north coast New South Wales. I was a junior member there. I, was, I think I was the current junior champion, and they paid for me to go to Sydney to attend that camp for a week. And uh, so, you know, you're down there with a whole lot of boys from, and this is where, you know, basically a lot of, golf in Australia it starts from the country areas mm. they all come to the city and you know and they get some coaching for the first time they get some serious coaching from good pros well one morning at daybreak I was down on the there's a kind of like a park down the bottom of where all the Narrabeen you know Narrabeen is mm. where the where the sports yeah. area is there and I was down on the, the oval just on daybreak hitting golf balls on my own and one of the pros was out having an early morning stroll and he stopped and he said what are you doing I said well i you know, I'm getting some practice in, and everyone's still asleep in the in their um, in their rooms. And uh, he said, "Why?" I said, "Well, I want to be a pro." And he said, um, "You know, asked me a few questions about that." And he said, "Well, I might be able to help you." And and uh, the guy's name was Mal Wilson, and Mal was finishing his training at the Australian Golf Club, and uh, he said, "I'll, I'll contact Daryl, my boss, who's the head professional there, and see if he can't get an interview." And that came out of the blue, but think about mm. it. I was standing down there on my own, mm. practicing away. I had, we had you know, a big garbage bin full of balls, and I was just practicing as I normally would do. Doing the extras. Probably. I was the only mm. person there, mm. apart from Mal having a walk past. But isn't it interesting, the irony of that situation is that he happened to be walking by mm. at that time, and uh, one thing led to another, and I got the job there as a, tra- a trainee professional. Mm and one of the top clubs in Australia mm. from the, you know, this poor kid from the bush. Mm. But, you know, the club had sent me down. So it's one of those things we've talked about so many times where... Synergy. Yeah, just things happen, yep. you know, and you're not really sure why. So how do I get from being from there to there? That's how it happened. Yeah. The bridge was literally that moment when I was down there practicing on my own. I didn't expect anybody to be around there. I just wanted to get some in before breakfast. The breakfast was like eight seven thirty, yeah. and I wanted to get some practice in before there, yeah. because there's a bit of a scramble for balls when all the guys are down there. You know, just didn't hit enough, yeah. so that I can get down there and get some extra. Right, and so that led to that, and I trained at the Australian Golf Club and uh, a bit of time at a couple of other clubs. Got through my training and got better, uh, although there was, you know, some challenges along the way I had to change some technique, and I struggled like crazy with that because mm. I was so used to doing it my way. Mm without much coaching and then all of a sudden I've got to do it a different way and so scores went higher and you know. So you went from the Australian Golf Club as a junior pro, you obviously qualified as a pro, you played professionally, you then converted to coaching. Yeah. Then you had the Rothmans Foundation, then you moved to the Australian women's team. Yeah. 
and then what and, and the state team as well I was coaching the state women's team yeah. and the state junior boys team all at the same time yeah so I had a, a ton of coaching going on um, and uh, yeah my, my big challenge was getting people to get better and so I kept thinking about why I wasn't good enough mm. I kept reflecting back on well I was practicing a lot right I was practicing a lot and but I I didn't understand the process of how you actually get better. How do, how is it that some of those guys on the range were shooting lower scores than me? What were they doing differently? I'd be playing with them. I played with some world-class players and I'd be taking note, right, of what they were doing. But somehow, and in some way, they were getting to a low score, lower than I was getting. Some examples of the players. Oh, well, at the time, um, you know, guys, I was playing when Norman was at the height of his powers didn't actually get to play with Norman, but I played plenty of times in and around him. Greg Norman, yeah. And he was at the height of his power, mm. so, I mean... World well, champ, he was what? Number one in the number world. Number one for how many weeks? I remember at a New Zealand Open, uh, where I was drawn, uh, Curtis Strange is standing over here, I think she, he'd just, he'd been US Open winner mm. either, was just before him winning US Open twice, two years in a row. I, I was in and around players, played with a lot of good Australian players, but the thing was, I couldn't see how... I was just doing a lot of hard practice, mm. hours. I'd mm. go into the bunker and work on my bunker play, and but I couldn't put the stitch it together. And it, it was my curiosity in understanding what I needed to do and how I like to read a lot. And I still do to this day lots and lots and lots of books. Biggest library I've ever seen. Uh, you Compared know, to... Well, similar to mine I guess on my Kindle but yours is massive isn't it yeah well it's a physical library I've got to think about how I'm going to get rid of that library mm. it's massive and, and then all my online stuff so uh, which I continue to do because I, I, one thing I realise I'm not very smart um, not uh, you know I, I, I left school early but, but I because of my curiosity and because I want to get better I just study things and I teach myself how to understand whatever it is that I need to understand to make progress that way and and it's through that that I started to probably look at the and when I was a kid Andrew um, I, I was dyslexic so I had a real learning challenge um, when I used to read things I'd, and I write things I'd write them backwards and and I don't remember who helped me to get out of that but but I, I was learning challenged and so school was tough for me mm. and I know that you know there are a lot of outliers that actually can that have had learning challenges so I found that reading was one of the greatest gifts that I ever got, that when I could read, so I should read a lot because I, I, you know, I didn't consider myself very smart. But through reading a lot and reading a lot of different things, and, and I'll explain as we go along about some of the mentors that came into my life that guided me in a totally different direction. Actually, I've got to mention one, uh, my, my very good friend who I've known now for a long time, who's my first mentor when I moved to Sydney to coach 30 years ago. Uh, John Hugo and John said Laurie said one of the first bits of advice I want to give him he's a very successful businessman he said you know when they go that way you go that way that's mm. the first thing he said to me he said do not go with, with the crowd he said whatever they're reading find something else to read find something different he said you will see in your industry as you move along that they'll all have a trend towards uh, they get excited about the same about sorts the same. of things yeah. he said I want you over there focusing on different things mm. and that's kind of that what, what actually that helped me to understand was my role in the Rothmans company and then working with uh, these other coaches, they were thinking about it differently. Yeah. And it was performance based. It was much more about score, but how to, how to be a faster swimmer, how to run faster or run further and, and so on. And so through John's great early guidance when I moved to Sydney to do all of this coaching, I mean, I was, I was coaching the national team and state teams and I was coaching at three driving ranges all at the same time. So I was crazy amount of work, driving around all over the place, then flying, and so Susie might Hundreds my, and hundreds of hours, yeah. Unbelievable. And then reading as much, and in those days, of course, no online, so I'm carrying books, bags full of books, and that's what i do at night. I'd sit there in the room after working, and I would just read. Yeah. Textbooks, things I didn't know about because I didn't do any Did, did you have the drive education. for this? Like, was it, or was it just innate happening at the time, or you just decided? I had a drive to get better and, and know more. Yeah. and know more about why I, at the time, why I couldn't get better. And then that turned into, how do I get someone else to get better? And then that led to just, through just reading an enormous amount of stuff outside of sports, business, 
Uh, the areas that I focused on in those days were, were business, a lot of business, because John encouraged me to read a lot of business books. So I'd read business. Uh, I was reading golf instruction books still, but moving away, I mm. read a lot. Going back, my library actually goes back 140 years. So I've got books that I've read going way back to the first books published. Mm. But then I got into military. I, I started to study the military because uh, I wanted to understand they're training people and they've got a record of thousands of years of training people. So there's a, this massive wealth of knowledge about how they get people to be better. So I went through this period of studying uh, special forces and, and like SEAL teams and SAS and, and I would study that. At the same time, I've got Bomper's book over here, you know, studying that. And I'm starting to look at it and I'm seeing all of these these conclusions that were similar about how to get people to get better and then you know some years and that went on for a long period of time but it went in trends particular directions and I would go in this direction and then some there'd be some reference to another book and I'd start there and that would take me so it's it like a tree of life mm. if you will a tree of knowledge and I just going along all these branches Eventually, it led to me to Western philosophy versus Eastern philosophy. Mm -hmm. And so I started to then study martial arts uh, because I wanted to know there's an ancient art, a way of training. And the, the, when you look at it from, say, Japanese or Korean or Chinese, and you see the very early forms of how martial arts and military training were all together entwined, I started to read that as well. So I was looking at what were the ancients doing? And... To this day, I'm sitting here still reading those books, um, books on samurai techniques, Musashi, you name it, all mm. sorts of people. Um, and so, again, this tree just keeps going and going and going. There's just no end to it. And I'm caught in it. I can't escape it now. I mean, uh, I got interviewed last week for something, and Terry, this friend of mine, um, who you'll meet, Terry said, uh, he said, I've never known you not whenever I went to your place. There'd always be 20 books piled up beside you your uh, your chair that you're reading, currently reading all this stuff. And I said, mate, I'm sitting on my bed having this interview with you, just finished training, and I've got 18 books sitting beside my bed. So I haven't escaped it, so I've got mm -hmm. online and offline. But point being that uh, the drive has always been to know more, um, and then as, as I knew more, I realized how I knew so little. Mm. I, I know so little, and uh, so I wake up every day with the beginner's mind. Uh, the white belt every day I wake up with a white belt mm. and I do not ever consider myself I feel it kind of embarrassed if someone tells me I'm a and you know me quite a while I, I actually feel embarrassed if someone tells me I'm, I'm good at something I don't yeah. see myself a guru that way. or a yeah a I, legend. I see myself as someone who just genuinely wants to get mm. up every day and learn more so Laurie how important it sounds to me like humility is extremely important to you I, I think it is and I'll tell you why I think it is I think I've met a lot of pretty successful people in my life Andrew uh, through golf you, you just you just do you meet a lot of I mean I've met heads of state and very famous people um, I mean one day just a quick story I'm a trainee pro in at the Australian Golf Club it's late in the day probably an hour before sunset and this old man turns up with an entourage and um, my my boss Daryl was just leaving for the day he said Laurie I want you to take care of this so I, I go out to the golf cart and I sit down and the old man sits beside me and uh, his entourage stayed up. He said, you guys stay here, I'll go down with a bucket of balls. He's gonna hit some balls on the range. It was Bob Hope. Here am I at the time, I'm 18 years old and I used to watch Bob Hope movies all the time. So huge star in Hollywood. This just Bob Hope and me sitting on the driving range and he said, you just sit in the cart. He said, if you see anything, just say anything. And I'm watching Bob Hope hit golf balls and just two of us on the driver, there's no one else around. Fascinating, isn't it? So, <laughs> obviously, like, would you say synergy and humility kind of work together? Because that's another synergistic moment in your life that he happens to be there in the time you're there. Um, those things, I've had a bunch of those through my life, Andrew. Um, and I wanted to mention this one. When I finished training as a professional, um, I got, I'm broke, I got no money. This is so after Bob Hope, like, I finished my training. So I go back to my... Uh, to Foster, to Uncurry, the hometown. And I get a job, uh, Peter Craig was the head pro there, and we, we just built a new course on, in Tunkari And there was 13 holes in play, and I, I became the pro under Peter there, the assistant pro. And I spent lots of quiet days where there's no golfers, because it's brand new. Yeah. No one even knows about it. Yeah. 
so I'm sitting there and uh, and I'm thinking about and I could go out and practice there's no one around so and there wasn't much grass around the course was being laid out I'd be hitting balls off the sand and on my holidays I'd go and play some pro-ams right so that was the plan so I'm practicing anyway one day you know there's always someone would drive up this dirt road and come and play the short course 13 holes so this guy turns up and I'm sitting behind the counter and you know and he asked me a couple of questions and and I don't know how this relates to it but it is strange that morning that the green keepers would bring in the, the they'd read the newspaper and then they would leave it there for whoever came in the day and it's an old house I think it's still a house there today I haven't been there for years but the house a two-story house was the clubhouse they'd moved there so I'm, I'm there and I'm reading the stars I, I was reading the sports section I read the stars and then stars said something like I'm an Aquarian right my wife says Aquarian um, and uh, I'm reading my stars and, and they said something like something that you really want is going to happen uh, to you. It's going to open the doors up for lots of things. They are one of those nice positive messages, right? And I, I left it at that. Anyway, not that long later, this guy turns up and he said, can I have a lesson? And I was doing a few lessons then, but not many. And I said, sure. So I go down to the driving, the practice fairway and watch him hit some golf shots. And I'm like 20 years old, tw 21 maybe just qualified and I'm watching this guy hit balls and he says what are you doing here <laughs> and I go well uh, I'm here to save money so I can go out and play on the pro tour and he, and he asked a few more questions and he said how much would you need to, to do that and I went uh, about X amount and he said maybe I can help you you seem like a reasonable fella anyway um, so John Dowling turned out to be one of these moments in my life. So, so this guy's John Dowling. This guy's John Dowling, and John Dowling had an interesting story as well. He helped his best friend. John had won a small lottery. He's a geologist working in New Guinea, um, prospecting for gold. His friend, he, this is a story John relayed to me years ago. He said, my friend was living in a mining house that he wanted to buy He's got a family, married a local lady up there, and uh, but, but he was going to lose the house payments, whatever the payment was. There was some transaction that he, he didn't have the money, and John said, I'll, I'll lend you the money, no problem at all. In return for that, John got shares in uh, his friend's mine, which they were digging away at mm -hmm. and stuff. And cut a long story short, that mine ended up becoming one of the, uh, one of the great mines there, um, and on the stock exchange it came under New Guinea Gold. All those shares that John got just went, there were lots of them and they mm. went through the roof. And at mm. one stage when he would travel with me to some of the tournaments caddying for me, I know he said, Laurie, the shares are at $16. And so he became wealthy through his generosity to yeah, his yeah. friend. Yeah. And then he was being generous to me and helping me out. So he sponsored me to be able to play and discover whether that was going to be the thing that I needed to do. Um, but you see how it just again one of those moments out of the blue that was the second time because the first time was when I was practicing on my own then the pro gets me to the club this is the second time now I can get onto the tour the third time was when I became a coach and I get the job with the Rothmans Foundation now the work had been that I was doing the coaching with, with Ross Ross liked me I used to get on well with Ross he was leaving foundation so he, he put in a recommendation for me I still had to go through a formal process but I was doing a lot of coaching and I was very keen to be good at it and so that led to that and so it seems like in my life along the way there's always been these punctuated moments mm. where critical moments where there was a turning point yeah um, where and I always say to Susie my wife I say you know wherever I get to the end of something something good will come along mm. Mm. Um, another door will open as one shuts and I believe that mm. and so I and I've always believed that mm. and more so since those things have happened mm. but always along the way Andrew I'll say this John Hugo has always been there for me even though I don't speak to him as much now he lives in Sydney he's always there for me he was like a father mm. figure for me uh, and gave me enormous advice helped me out in so many ways and Sue's in so many ways and I think that that's critical as well that mm. you have someone that you can bounce ideas off or when you're troubled by things 
you need the old head with experience and wisdom and John is just full of wisdom and experience mm. so well speaking about that mate you've got this facility here and it obviously looks a bit industrial it wasn't it wasn't even there in the first place I want to talk to you about a little bit about that journey and then back to wisdom mm. how that then transfers to the to the young students you've got and the, and the, and the results they're getting sure uh, so Dave and I always had, so when we arrived here in Indonesia, we were wor actually working at the opposite end of this driving range down mm. there, just running some camps and things, but we thought this could be the spot. This is, it's just out of Jakarta. It's going against the traffic in the morning. So all those things were mm. good ideas, mm. as you know, driving with me in the morning, you know what the traffic's like. Um, so this seemed like a good idea. And this tea area that we're on was already here, but the green wasn't. And the general manager at the time was, um, built a green and so we thought this could be the ideal place and we needed obviously funding for that which is where we made we pitched to the Indonesian Golf Association about the idea of helping them to develop a national program from from nothing had you seen this place before you put the proposal forward you did a recce came over yeah and... we, we ran a few camps here yeah so we knew that this was a good location yeah. I mean we knew the clubs in the area but that this was a good location mm. for it because you know, in thinking about it, you need space. You, you know, you're coaching players and so on. You need space, and what? you need privacy. The yeah. other thing is, we we didn't want to be with the public. With everyone else, we want, because if we, if we're going to build a program, with, we don't need the public. Yeah. You know, in and around us, there's plenty of places for the public to practice. It's interesting too, though, Laurie. You had a vision of what you wanted to do, but you didn't just go out anywhere and make it happen. You, you actually took some time about it to get something that was more ideal. Yeah. Well, we, we had to go through and get a SWOT analysis. Whoever we were going to present to, we couldn't just say. Uh, we want money and we're good. It, you know, they didn't know who we were. Mm. And uh, but we went through and it was a detailed proposal over took two hours. And and the chairman, who's a businessman, very successful businessman, he appreciated that we'd gone to that trouble. He said that makes you very different to the normal mm. golf pro who would yeah, just yeah. said, "I want a job, put your hand up and get a job." Well, you've pitched an idea, and that it's a big idea. It's uh, it's a ten year long-term plan that Dave and I both um, believe in mm. and because you you know as you know it's 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 about you've got to look at these things long term mm. you know but it's not always easy to do mm. so we put it down on paper and and uh, as I said one thing led to another and it led to this and you know um, there's functional and there's fancy and uh, I've been to a lot of golf academies around the world and I've seen five star they're fancy and yeah, yeah. And we're not fancy. Um, we're all about function. So we, we you know, we, through, with the help of one of the directors of the company that was set up to assist us to be on the ground here, you know, we, we went for containers, put them all together and created a very functional That's place. Like, it is, four containers with a roof, yeah, put yeah, on top. Yeah, absolutely. And it, you know, we had rain this morning, heavy rain, yeah. but the guys were able to practice in it. And it's yeah. the only time yeah. they do. We like to practice on the yeah. grass. we well, got one of the longest... Right, like the viewers can't see it, but it's one of the longest uh, grass driving ranges I've ever seen. Yeah, it's 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 about 75 metres long, mm. um, you know, and about 20 metres wide. So it's quite a lot of grass and downhill mm. and uphill mm. and, and all of those sorts of things. But the whole idea was to come here and build a national program, mm. something they didn't have. I mean, mm. they don't really focus on that golf's not one of the sports here. The big sport here is badminton, and they're very good at it. Um, so they have a world-class focus on their badminton you, because they've got great players, they've had many, but not golf. Mm. Golf was pretty much driving ranges, rubber mats, hitting from undercover. Mm. Here, here we stand we stand outside for five hours, I still do, every yeah. day with the guys, five hours in the sun and driving them hard. Yeah. And uh, Just to, yeah. like, to me, that's your point of difference is you talk about functional, not fancy. Yeah. But I also see your point. If you're like a golf whisperer compared to a golf teacher, right, you look at the game and the person so differently to other instructors I've seen and obviously with my background in golf, golf university, etc. Yeah, you have more experience of that than I would. I mean, I, I know a lot of pros, my friends over the years, but I, you know, I, I'm, I would consider myself, I'd probably fit into that classic introverted profile where I, I, I spend a lot of time on my own. I mm. like it, mm. like my own time. Having said that, you spend many hours a week with people, right? Helping I do. Them. Yeah, I, so I, I help people, and then I just I'm happy to go and switch off yeah. and, and put my headphones in and go yeah. and read books and work on programs and stuff, and quite happy to do that for hours yeah. on end without anybody being around. But going back to the two, I understand that because I know you. But the difference is 
So not only are you doing something different here off the bat, it's a new vision, it's a new way of golf development mm. for a nation. Yeah. But then it's not just about that. You're, the way you coach people is not normal. Do you want to explain a little bit more about that? You may not even realize that, but... Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I don't look at... Firstly, from a golf point of view, Andrew, to start with, I don't look at the swing and say, I need to fix something that's broken here. Mm. I just don't see it that way. I listen to what the person says and how they describe their experience of what golf is to them. Ask some clever questions, if you will, like some questions that might stump them a little bit. Do they think they're coming for a golf lesson? Yeah, but, you know, I, I don't just, you know... Actually, before I would work in this situation when I was running my golf school, and every so often I'd do some private lessons. I got more and more out of doing private one-on-ones, mm. and, and I like to... We, You know, our golf school model was, you know, what we like to do, where you... Um, this is prior to me working with Dave. I had a successful golf school business that I set up in 94, and we would travel with groups to New Zealand, North and South Island, um, Gulf Harbour in the north, and... Uh, uh, down in Queenstown in the south at Millbrook mm. and um, you know and spend five days with people and do the golf school thing which is just a much better model and I, I did that all the way up to moving across with Dave and setting up this program so I like the idea of working with groups not one on one why is that? Um, well basically it sort of fits the situation better one on one there's not a lot of leverage work I mean I'd have to charge you're trading time for money aren't you? Yeah, and, I, and you know John told me my mentor told me many many years before you've got to get out of that habit of trading time for money just stop doing it you have to find a way to generate leverage and the best way is with groups you know a group of people paying X amount not as much as they would pay one on one but collectively but it was a, it would make a lot more so when I was running golf schools on the Gold Coast before I moved to Perth um what I could generate in a week from a golf school compared to someone standing on the range giving one lesson was probably in the vicinity of five times as much for less hours. Yeah. So, but I learned that a long time ago. And so my, my business side, because I, from the very early stages, this is important, I stopped seeing myself as a golf professional. Yeah. I saw myself as someone who was reasonably skilled at the game, but I was in the business of of developing golfers but not as a golf teacher person mm. so is it a system is it a methodology or, or is it even a mindset is that the difference it's all of those things it's it's certainly a system I, I found that the best way to help people to get to where they want to get to is help to define the path for them initially you know if they're learning something they've never learned before you know give them a structure that they can learn and, and make it reasonably simple don't make it complex one of the things I learned from Brian Tracy many years ago at one of the seminars, famous Canadian speaker, um, is you know he, he talked about this law of complexity where if you've got, say, a, um, a, a level of information, and he talks about one square equals one. If you can focus on one core thought, it's easy to, to do, easy to work on, easy to do. Two core thoughts, he says, it's squaring upon itself, so it becomes a level four of um, complexity and three things to focus on would be a level nine of complexity so it's squaring upon itself so we want to so i've always been sort of influenced to keep things simple but but to define it very very clearly and uh and i think that's that's important so from a system point of view create simple systems that people can follow from those places they can then discover where they want to go to mm. so in an algorithm sense it might be going a to b B to, uh, A to B, B to C, C to D, and back to the beginning again. But they can always expand that loop and bring an E into it and an F into it and a G into it and so on, which is what you do in a lot of yep. learning. If you're learning music or anything, you start with some basic chords. And then extend on and it. You, and you learn from it, yeah. And so from a business sense, that's where the leverage came in. You started creating information products, a lot of video-based stuff for, yeah. for learning. I did. And, you know, and I did one interesting thing back in the early days of golf lessons on YouTube you know 10 or plus years ago when I I did a whole bunch of videos and I uh, part of my studies over the years had been hypnosis and uh, NLP but predict particularly the the hypnosis side and what I did is I embedded a lot of stuff into the content of my um, presentations on YouTube and I think at this stage over the 10 years I think we've had over 7 million mm. I think 6 to nearly 7 million views mm. Uh, with no with no um, 
real marketing mm. doing it. But but clearly people found the the message that was con- consistent was simple to understand, mm. simple to do. Mm. And I think that's important. Mm. Uh, me knowing being being someone who struggled, maybe that yeah. the reason I'm like that is because I struggled so much with yeah. the learning in the early days. So it's really interesting you talk about systems and you talk about simplification of systems. Right. But for the outliers that are out there who are trying to fit into a system mm. that ain't simple, it doesn't work for them. Yeah. What you got to you create your then? own. I mean, the whole thing is this is where your own personal education comes in. You got to read the books, watch the videos, listen to the audios. You got to find what other people are doing with their systems, and then go. You know, my, mine's been a case of just basically creating the uh, the vehicle in the background that's a that's made up of junkyard parts. You know, I've got this car that drives around really well, but it's it's made up of cars out of the car park, out of the junkyard. Yeah. So you've taken bits from everyone else and made it your All own. All sorts of bits, yeah. and pieces to find my own systems yeah. that have been tested and trialed enough times to see what works in most cases not yeah. every case i would never suggest that it does because then it is too much like a methodology that doesn't have any yeah. flexibility about it well it's interesting that you had dyslexia you struggled with learning and yet learning's become one of the biggest support tools for you to get where you're to it's go. everything it's everything and it's also helped your students because you've had to simplify it for yourself to understand it that then allowed you to do it for the students so isn't that incredible that one of your biggest challenges has actually become one of your biggest strengths I would say so, um, and that hasn't been easy at any stage of, of, of the journey thus far. Uh, but, you know, I, I go out of my way to make sure that someone understands what it is I'm saying to them. I just don't want to speak for the sake of it, to hear my own voice. Uh, I, I once was accused of that I don't waste words, and, and that's, that's the truth. I mean, I, I go out of my way, Andrew, to make sure that someone does understand what I'm saying and when I say understand, I mean they truly understand. Mm. I'm not going to walk away if they don't understand it, mm. which means sometimes they're going to hear the message again and again, but maybe I'm going to change the message. I have to be the flexible one, mm. you know, because if my message is not being understood, it's not their problem. Mm. That's important. It's mm. my problem. Mm. So for an entrepreneur or someone building a business, they've got to understand that if they think that they've got the right system and that they've just got to sell it, it's probably wrong. Mm that the fact of the matter is it's always going to be flexible. If it's so systematic that it doesn't change, then yeah, you'll get a few people who fit in the cookie cutter approach, Mm. but you won't get everybody. Mm. And and the bottom line is successful entrepreneurs uh, tend to be people who have built a system that is flexible enough because they can actually attract more people. You've got some of your friends that have owned ski schools and things like this that you've actually interviewed that started with one and end up with you know a lot of instructors and a lot of people coming through the through their businesses. Mm. Well, you have to have a level of flexibility. Yes, there's systems in place, but you also have to have the flexibility to work around them. Well, I think that's what makes you a bit of an outlier in the golf space is you're not making it about the swing and the swing has to fit everyone has to fit the swing you're making it the other way around where you as the coach are asking the questions of the person and then making it about them yeah if four questions um or four four words what do you want and then i stop and listen and then they may not know what they want and i say well if you did know what you want what would that be i still don't know what i want well so maybe the first challenge is how can i help someone if they don't know what they want Mm. so i have to get to a place where we can build a bridge where I have some level of understanding of what they think they want. And it might be a case that they don't really know for sure, and then that may be my challenge. I've got to help them to find what it is that they want. How would you suggest that? Like for the outliers out there who know they, they feel different, they feel like they don't belong, but they know they want to make a difference. Well, they have to know what difference means. Yeah. You know, because the thing about life is for every person on the planet, it's different. Yeah. It's not the same. Yeah. There are samenesses and there are differences. A sameness is when you do have a system that is basically operating the same way. The difference is everybody's got to experience that sameness differently. Mm. Yeah, because we all are technically one, but we're also unique in that oneness, aren't we? We're all looking at the world differently. Every person yeah. that I work with, um, doesn't matter what they're doing, is going to share with me what they think what they believe their experience to be Mm. of a particular situation, Mm. whatever the context happens to be. And the content for each person is going to be different. Mm. So they could be standing here, say, hitting golf shots, but they're all different doing Mm. it. Mm. They're thinking different thoughts. Mm. What the one common denominator with all of them is, what do they want? Yeah. 
So, and which again will be different for everyone. So you got four questions. What do you want? Hmm. And then what? How? What's next? So to understand what what is, I explain that what what is what is a behaviour. So the thing about change is, yeah, you know, people talk about you change your mindset. Well, I believe you change your your behaviour to change your mindset. I think you've got to do the physical. You've got to do the work. One of the things that I constantly struggle with is I meet people, very bright people, who stop reading, who stop learning once they left university, mm. particularly university. They go, that's it, I read enough in university, I don't want to do it anymore. I go, big problem for you. Mm. Life doesn't stop, everything's moving. If you want to be a successful entrepreneur and you're an outlier, you need to study. You need to study your markets so much better than everybody else mm. if you're going to be successful. Successful might mean that you just generate a level of um, profit if it could be a profitable thing or you, you're making a massive difference to someone's life or a, 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 a particular niche of people's lives whatever it happens to be you've got to really know what that is mm. and never never kind of one pro old pro said to me many years ago he said and this is all around method he said learn a method and like throw your hat down and say that's the way you do it I've never been able to accept that mm. someone would even say what's your method of teaching Laurie and I go I don't know. I'm not sure. More changes, yeah. Well, I'm a white belt every day. Mm. Like I literally am a white belt every mm. day. I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, that's where I'm at. Mm. I, I'm, I have a beginner's mind every day, mm. which is in Japanese a shoshin. Mm -hmm. I, I have a beginner's mind. And so you'd encourage the outliers, the entrepreneurs, to have a yeah, beginner's I, mind. I think that's where humble is. Humble is in learning. I mean, I started humble. I couldn't learn. I couldn't write properly. Mm. You know, I was having all sorts of trouble. I do remember that. I struggled. And uh, so homework, um, writing, even the board, you know, the teacher would be writing on the board and I'm trying to write and then she'd be wiping half the board out. I didn't get to finish anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was left-handed and, and it was just at the end of that period where they, you know, they wanted you to be right-handed, but I was left-handed. Are you a devil's child? Is that, <laughs> that's what they called you, wasn't it? <laughs> Could be. Uh, I never got the, the, the slaps on the wrist or the canes on the wrist like some people did, the earlier generations than me, where they made you into a right-handed writer mm. back in the days when mm. you were using mm. ink and you know ink pots and so on but yeah. uh but yes yeah, so i struggled so much with learning in the early days that i had to do something different mm. and there was that side and, and one of the things i also learned is is that particularly while i work a lot of hours is i have to work i have to be fit and strong and healthy mm -hmm. so, so you've got other support tools that you use to keep I yourself have to, sharp. i've got to be in the gym i've got to be i've got to be um, as healthy as i can be um so that I can keep pushing at the level that I want to push at, mm -hmm. you know? I, mean, this is, I like being where I am. Yep. I like working lots of hours. It, it suits me. Yep. What I've learned is I work with people who don't want to work like I do. Mm. I struggled with that for a long time, Andrew. I struggled yep. working with people who just didn't have the same values or, or look at the world the same way. I'm now, I'm a lot more relaxed about it. Mm. I mean, it's, t it's a tough one. Mm. Because if I'm working with young players who want to be good, I, and I've played on the professional tour, I've practiced a lot and I've done all those things and I've, I know what it's like to play well and I know, like, know what it's like when I'm missing cuts and not, not being happy. And I work with players now that do those things. It's very hard to explain to them from their young eyes mm. to build that bridge to say you just don't understand how hard you have to work mm. to be good at something. Because mm. there are people all around the world doing what you're doing right now, mm. but how are you going to be different to mm. them? If they're all doing one thing, if the sameness is that they all practice, then what is the difference? Well, that's the difference that I see in you. So before we get to that, and we've already spoken a lot about it, is, well, to me, you look you look at golf more as a reflection of life, yeah? Or life as a reflection of golf. You it's could, a, it's they, a great walk. microcosm for each other. It's a great walk, but it's it's a terrible walk for some people. Yeah. Right? But, uh, but that's really more of an internal thing, would you say, that's going on? Do they bring their life to golf and it starts to project outwardly when they're playing? Particularly in the West, I find here in in Asia that I've never like particularly in Indonesia. Like we've got one of our our practice greens next to one of the holes. I hear so much joy, mm. people having so much fun out on the golf course. Indonesians mm. know how to have fun. Mm. Like they, they the guys will do a bit of betting and stuff. And but if someone holds a shot or something, they're all so happy. They're all celebrating, right? Mm. Even though one guy's probably lost a ton of money from it. Yeah. Um, whereas in the West, you get all these stressed out types. I've seen them yeah, on the yeah. golf course. I've yeah. seen people get angry. Yeah. I had a fr years ago, I had a friend that uh, a professional who someone hit up on him and um in the group behind and they had words and the guy waited for him in the car park that night and he got the hell beat out of him mm. 
I mean, over golf, mm. just because he, this guy had done something dangerous mm. and, you know, so it's very different. Here, there's a real love. I find that a lot of people in the West, it's, it's about, it's this perfection-driven uh, idea. I know I'm talking about just average just golfers. Amateur social golfers. Yeah, I'm not golfers. talking about the yeah, elite players. They'll never players. actually go better no, than, say, but they an 18 handicap. give themselves a hard time yeah. about their learning and mm. instead of probably being a little humble mm. with the walk and learning along the way and finding a good teacher, someone mm. who they can relate to and taking some lessons. That, look, even though i got you know a good following on YouTube and stuff, I mean... That was just really for me an experiment to share a few ideas and hopefully help a few few people out. But people mm. that want to get better, you need to find a good teacher. Mm. You know, if it's in martial arts, you go to a good dojo and mm. you, you find a good sensei mm. and uh, someone who has a track record who can teach you the things you need mm. to learn. Golf, tennis, doesn't matter what it is. Well, we earlier we had swing lesson for me. I haven't played for a couple, well, almost a year and a half, two years now. And, you know, we did one swing. We changed my swing instantly. And we changed the finger on a grip yeah. and instantly got more distance, got easier through the ball, etc. And if I had been to any other instructor or teacher, I probably would have, and a lot of the golfers out there would know this, I probably would have come away confused. But you had the ability again to simplify it with who would have thought a little finger shift could make such a big difference in distance, in accuracy, in ability to play through the ball. But to me, again, I keep saying it, that's the difference, right? Uh, yeah, I, do, I, do you feel different? Like no, I, I just, I just, I just look at it that way, and and I, I do want to convey a message that you understand. But one of the things that I learned m many years ago with Richard Bandler, one of the co-founders of NLP, was um, he, he really gave you the the idea that learning is easy. This is an important point. He said people don't have learning challenges. Mostly, I mean, I did. But what I learned was, he said, that it's translation they have problems with. So every person that comes along, you, it doesn't matter who it is, in my mind, the very first thing I say to myself is, this person is not learning challenged. If they can't hit a golf ball or if they can't achieve their goal, then there's some translation going on. There's some reason between where they are and where they want to get to that they don't understand what that journey is. Mm. So I, I want to share this really simple thing that will help enormously. Again, at a, at a business seminar a long time ago, well, yeah, it was a long time ago, probably very early days in my coaching, Brian Tracy shared a, an equation. And at the time, the equation was U times E equals R. And then later on, once I understood the equation, I changed it to R equals U times E. And essentially what it is, U times E equals R was understanding multiplied by effort equals the result that you get. What I did was I put the result at the front and said, results are equal to your understanding times your effort. Mm. I've got to tell you, Andrew, for 30 years, I've used that equation almost daily. For me personally, but remember, I'm not smart. I, I didn't finish school. I, I'm just book smart. I've read a lot and I've pushed myself to try to understand some things. Mm. But the equation is so simple because it starts with, okay, everyone wants a result. My responsibility is to find out what that result is to get really clear on what that person's result is, outcome if you will. At the other end of the equation is effort. Everybody's putting in some level of effort. Mm. Uh, young players here are practicing, hitting balls each day. But what makes the formula so unique, and Brian Tracy, I met him years later, and I said, you know, how much, I, I asked him, I said, I said that, that equation, he said, it's been so useful to me in my life, he said, you know what? He said, it's interesting you bring that. He said, it's an old Greek equation. He said, that goes back to the di times mm -hmm. when they're all sitting around Aristotle and all the boys sitting together. Eating grapes, yeah, drinking doing their wine. Thing, right? yeah. <laughs> he said, it goes back to them asking the question about the universe. Yeah. So, so the understanding, the you part of it. So if someone's battling out there and struggling, do you think it's... If they don't is understand... It them, or is it they just don't understand? Don't, you know, there, there are levels of understanding. There are layers of understanding. Yeah. And you meet people who are who are really specialized in something mm. could be an engineer but of, of a very specific uh, niche in engineering they are very deep at that level you know i saw something the other day you, you'd relate to this uh, someone was interviewing richard feynman the very famous physicist about it was simple it was about repelling magnets he said what's that all about he said i really can't explain it to you he said because there's no simple way to explain about the complexity of that I would have to teach you so many things. Mm. So what seems like, 
why can't they push together? They just don't. Yeah, they, it is exactly yeah. so you just they just don't. <laughs> Except that. Yeah. If you want to know more, then you have to understand this. Go into Richard, it you have to. Yeah. You have to. And, and so I've... So well, there's not a quick fix, bullet. You, if you want to understand none. more, put more effort in, learn from great teachers. There, there's, there is no fast track. Yeah. I don't care how clever the marketing is online and what they tell you. If you're gullible enough to believe it, and I have plenty of times, yeah. I'm gullible enough yeah. to have believed Love, it. Your emotion went up, didn't it? Yeah, you I thought, wow, well, if it's just now. that, yeah, if it's just that, and yeah, realise, yeah. no, no, it's still a lot of work, yeah, yeah. right? And when you see people who are quote unquote successful in things, mm. you realise they've done mm. a lot of work. Mm. And uh, well, let, let's summarise everything we've talked about so sure. far. If you were to help the young outliers, outliers in general, entrepreneurs, creators, dreamers, innovators. What's the little process they can follow? Let, let me start from this. Other uh, than the four questions, which we never finished. John Hugo, my, my mentor, yep. said to me, he said uh, a couple of things that have been really instrumental in me understanding the world a little bit differently. He said, number one, he said, um, you will become what you think about all day long. Mm -hmm. And that's not from him, that's from someone else, a very famous uh, speaker, Earl Nightingale. You will become what you think about all day long. So what you focus on and you, you direct your energy to yeah. it will grow and expand yeah. in your universe I t totally believe totally, that yeah. and he said you, you, he said Laurie you will attract into your life the people the situations and the circumstances in harmony with your dominant thoughts and I you know I can tell you that it comes out like a simple sentence for me because I've done it my whole life mm. since he taught it to me um, that when you direct your energy in a particular place and you stay focused on it, you learn about that thing and you, you remove the interference along the way. It's like you want to get this perfect wavelength without interference, without an interference coming in. Or in, in, in a simple law of physics where you know an object at rest remains so and an object moving moves in a di one direction until some other external yeah, force yeah. moves it. Yeah. Life is like that. The more focused you become on something, the more you attract into your world people that can help you move in the direction mm. of that. That is what I found when I wanted to become a professional. I was practicing more. I wanted that and Mal Wilson walked past mm. and he said, I think I can help you with that. When I was practicing at, at a little golf course and no one around, then this guy comes in and has a lesson with me, asks me, what do I want? Uh, I end up getting sponsorship to play on the tour. When I retire from playing on the tour and I, and I get a job with the Rothmans Foundation, I work with coaches from other sports who've been coaching as long as I have now. And, and they help me to understand the books to read. And, and then that was a struggle. Mm -hmm. but, but, so it's been that constant focus on what I wanted uh, to the exclusion of all else. The biggest challenge today for young people is the distraction mm -hmm. factor is so high, the interference is so high. How do they reduce that? Two, you, two questions. How do they reduce it knowing that they're focusing on what they really want to be focusing on? Because some, some people just focus on anything, think it's going to make them money or whatever, but how do you tune into what you really are, your calling is, and then not become distracted? First things first. I mean, you have to look at the things that are getting in your way to begin with. For you to run the 100 metres and run it in 10 seconds, what's going to get in the way? Well, it might be hurdles. You have to become a good hurdler. But let's say it's just an open track. But maybe you've got to dodge a whole lot of people along the way that want to, maybe you're a famous runner and, and they want to interview you and that you just really need to break the tape at the, other time, at the other side as fast as you possibly can. So here's the first thing. Turn off all the notifications on your phone. Mm. Turn your phone off. Turn your iPads and your uh, laptops off and everything else mm. at certain times. Read books. If it's an online book, read the book. Mm. Don't have the phone on at the same time mm. with notifications pinging all the time mm. because actually the technology is fantastic. They, they, the people that build the technology understand Very how people smart. learn. Yeah. And they go, you know what? It's just called addictive technology. Mm. It's like the gambling industry, isn't it? It's, with all the it's bells just and like that. So yeah. you don't want pings and, and things. What I do is at the end of my work here, then I can look at my phone and the messages will be there, but there's been no mm. pinging. I don't even mm. go to it. Mm. I don't even want to have my phone. The only thing I use my phone for, taking photographs. So yeah. I'm taking photographs yeah. of what we're doing or because I want to post and something. you certainly make up media. for it afterwards though, don't you? I do, yeah. I have a bit of fun there. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, So going back to the guys, right? Yeah. So distraction, remove distraction. It's number one. You yeah. can't do anything in life if, if there's things in the way. So, I mean, that it wouldn't matter what it is. The thing is this, um, it, it's, it's like nature. You plant a little tree. 
the first thing you have to do. Well, you'd water it or you'd nurture it. Yeah, that's, that you would. But, but also the thing is that that little plant needs to be propped up for some time until it becomes strong enough to do its own thing. Um, if you look at the down on the Great Australian Bight, you see a lot of the trees that grow down there with the heavy winds are all blown in one direction and bent over permanently. You know, if you don't start off light, life the right way, Andrew, if you don't start off with good mentors, good teachers, good people to encourage you, um, then you might grow a bit crooked. You know, you might get further away from where you really want to go to. If you don't know where you want to go to, the stick also helps, doesn't it? Put the stick in the ground, a nice true and straight stick, the tree can grow true and straight. Fantastic. Well, Laurie, thanks so much for sharing your story in a beautiful location, an outlier location. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks very much, Andrew. Great. Uh, I've had a great time here, mate, and thanks for having me. Well, thanks, Laurie. You're officially an outlier, my friend. <laughs> thanks so much, mate. Appreciate it. Well, there it is, guys. I hope you enjoyed this inspiring outlier TV episode with Laurie Montague. For more videos, resources, and information, go to outlier.tv or connect with us on our social media pages below. I'm Andrew McComb, and here's to living the outlier life outside of the comfort zone. I'll see you soon.